y'all be tuning in to another episode of the Hood Paralegal Podcast. It's your boy Corey tuning in with y'all today, and today we're talking about the rape culture in the military. This part two, to our part one of the series. Before I start, I want to get a special shout out to the Milwaukee Academy of Science the girls basketball team, the Lady Nova, for their championship run this year, state basketball tournament. You know, they did a good job. Y'all got runner up, but y'all was the real champions. You know, you got discriminated against and cheated basically by these racist refs and these racist systems, this WIAA discrimination, what they do all the time when we got good African-American teams that pose a threat to their agendas. But y'all did y'all thing, and I salute y'all. Now back to this episode, you know, I want to start by talking about, you know, some politicians have been fighting and failing for years to change these military laws. Ever since 2013, Senator Kirsten Gillibrand in New York has introduced legislation to move the decision to prosecute major military crimes, including sex crimes, out of the hands of commanders and into those of independent prosecutors. And every year it has failed to move forward. The Pentagon opposed the idea saying that it will undermine institutional leadership. At least 70 senators and President Biden have indicated their support for Gillibrand's bill this year, but it still faces opposition from the leaders of the Armed Services Committee. Senator Jack Reed, Democrat of Rhode Island, and James Inhofe, Republican of Oklahoma, Reed blocked an attempt by Gillibrand in May to bring the bill to a floor vote, saying that he found the legislation too broad because it seeks to change how the military handles all serious crimes, not just sexual assaults. In a bill with provisions put forward by both Gillibrand and Reed was incorporated into the annual defense bill, the De- National Defense Authorization Act, which will most likely be taken up by Congress for a vote later this year. Now, support for change is also now coming from the Pentagon itself. In late April, a Pentagon organized independent commission on military sexual assault made the first of a series of recommendations to Secretary of Defense Lloyd J. Austin. The third, they included removing commanders from prosecutorial decisions for sexual assault and related crimes. You know, Colonel Don Christensen, a retired chief Air Force prosecutor who is now president of Protect Our Defenders, a nonprofit organization dedicated to reducing rape and sexual assault in the military, says that this year is difficult in large part because of the murder of specialist Vanessa Gilliam, whose body was found in Texas in June 2020. Gilliam reported, had reportedly been sexually harassed by a fellow soldier before her death and an army investigation revealed the cultural harassment and bullying at Fort Hood where she was based. The independent review of what was going on at Fort Hood was incredibly damaged, stated Christensen. In April 2021, the Army also had to suspend 22 instructors from Fort Seal in Oklahoma after a trainee was sexually assaulted. In January 2021, President Trump signed into law the Deborah Simpson Act, a comprehensive bill named after a woman who posed as a woman during the Revolutionary War in order to serve in the Continental Army. The law includes provision to monitor and address sexual harassment and sexual assault at VA health centers and women to report harassment or assault. It is also requires VA employees to report harassment they observe and be punished if they don't. Now, if Gillibrand's bill becomes law, it will arrive a major shift, a vote out of the old way doing things and a mission by the government that the military justice system must finally be changed. If military, if independent military prosecutors rather than commanders handle the prosecutorial decision-making process, more accused rapists and other assailants may be brought to the court martial. But without sentencing reform, they may not ultimately be held more accountable. You know, in conclusion, the military needs a pervasive shift in his culture and the mindset of his leaders. Now, thank you, everybody, for tuning in today. And please like, share, and comment on your opinions, you know, about this rape culture. And share any story that you have. If you know someone who experienced this, you know, share their story or whatever it may be. And comment and spread the word. I appreciate you for tuning in to another episode of the Paralegal Podcast. It's your boy, Corey, signing out. Every help, everyone have a blessed and successful week. And keep the energy positive. Love. Good day, everyone. My name is Ron Curtis, representing Hill Bear Legals. Today the topic is rape culture in the military, which should not be a topic being discussed, but sadly it is. 
So today we want to give encouragement to those who have been discouraged. Sexual assault is often the initial signal in a long line of painful traumas that can culminate in a post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, and suicide. In the 2019 study, scientists at the Denver Veterans Affairs Medical Center, the University of Utah, and the University of Colorado survey more than 300 service women and female veterans who have experienced a sexual assault and found that 29% were currently contemplating suicide. From 2007 to 2017, the age of suicide rate among women veterans rose by 73%. According to Department of Defense data, in 2019, women accounted for 31% of all suicide attempts among active duty service members. Because the military sexual assault triggers multiple traumas, victims frequently experience feelings of betrayal, isolation, and worklessness that can stop, that can stop them from all out to keep going. For one thing, military sexual assaults happen in an environment in which multiple surveys show Women feel they are repeatedly treated as if they don't belong. And women are typically assaulted by the men they serve with, sometimes even those, even their direct superiors, so they don't have to continually see and work with their assailants, wondering if, if it would ever happen again. After their attacks, victims also rarely see justice. Rarely see justice. Of the more than 6,200 sexual assaults reported made by the U.S. state, by the United States service members in the fiscal year 2020, only 50 zero in the sex offenses convictions under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. Roughly one third as many convictions as in 2019. It's unclear why sexual assault convictions have gone down, but it is a but it is part of a much larger trend. Courts marshals dropped by 69 percent from 2007 to 2017, according to Military Times perhaps because commanders are instead choosing administrative punishments, which are bureaucratically easier, but also result in milder punishments for those perpetrators, for the perpetrators, such as deductions in rank or administrative discharges. Even when convicted, perpetrators don't often spend time in prison. Many people don't receive a single day of confinement, Christian says. He pointed to the case of Rock Turner, the Stanford swimmer who was convicted of three counts of sexual assault spent only three months in prison. The uproar that was caused in California and across the nation by his sentence is kind of a weekly occurrence in the military, he says. That's the lie that is perpetrated before Congress constantly. That's all commanders are crushing these people. They want them they want to hold them accountable, Chris has said. No they don't. Many service members leave the military soon after experiencing sexual trauma and not voluntarily. Not only are military rapists rarely punished but their victims are often punished for reporting what happened. According to a 2018 survey of active duty service members by the Department of Defense, 38% of service women who reported their assaults experienced professional retaliation soon after. The original assault that after the reliable system of justice and the lingering isolation can send victims into spirals of anger and self-blame and cause them to self-medicate with alcohol or drugs. They are twice as likely as other women veterans to later experience intimate partner violence. Yet many don't realize the pain that we're, that we're experiencing stem down from, says Sarah Kinzel, a research professor in the University of Southern California, Suzanne Dorick Peck School of Social Work, so they don't know what kind of help they even need. Even when veterans can get a VA health care, they don't always feel safe enough to pursue it. In many VA clinics, women find themselves surrounded by men, some of whom harass and assault them, compounded their traumas. A 2019 study found that one in four women veterans were harassed by other veterans during visits to the VA health clinic. After leaving the Army, Sybil struggled. Over the nearly 13 years she spent as a soldier, she picked up many military styles, mannerisms, talking loudly, cursing, standing, with her feet planted wildly, all of which made it harder to transition back to civilian life. She was told by those around her that she was too brash, too different, and that made her feel more isolated and alone. In closing, we are responsible for fulfilling the duties of a brotherhood slash sisterhood. The military should be a place of uprightness, good character, and honesty. 
Let's resolve justice and give our military women a sense of comfort and equality. As always, we encourage comments, opinions, questions, and all feedback. Thank you for tuning in. Until next time.